Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to start with the last presentation of the day, so we will take our seats. And it gives me pleasure to uh, introduce to you Roberta Estes. And Roberta is a Bachelor and Master's degree in Computer Science, Master's in Business Administration, graduate work in GIS systems, uh, and runs her own business, DNA Explained, uh, and also a very, very popular blog on genetic genealogy, uh, DNAexplained.com. So uh, today, uh, Roberta is going to talk to us about nine autosomal tools and family tree DNA and how to use them. Please, can you give her a very warm welcome? Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the really good news is that we don't have any competition over here. Those sessions are over, so we might actually make it through the session without any uh, uh, audiovisual issues. Um, how many people in here have DNA tested? All right, has anybody not DNA tested? Okay, the two of you, <laughs> she's got one in the bag. Uh, uh, has everybody autosomal DNA tested? Yeah, good. Because we're gonna be talking about the tools at Family Tree DNA today uh, and tips and techniques. Now, as you probably have noticed, uh, most of the people here, I'm going to assume, are like rabid uh, genetic genealogists. And they've tested, like, at every place you can test, okay, at least two or three places, right? And you'll have noticed, I'm sure, that if you tested at Ancestry, that they are um, simpler than if you've tested at Family Tree DNA. You have more advanced tools, which means you probably need a little more advanced understanding to navigate them usefully. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about those tools. Now you don't have to take notes because we're, um, Morris is going to put this uh, session on the YouTube channel in a few days when he uh, gains his sanity again and having done this. And you, if you want to step through it on the YouTube channel, it's there for you to do. So you don't have to take notes. But if anything, what I really would like for you to take away from this today is what kind of tools they are, and in general, what they can do for you uh, as a genetic genealogist. Uh, oh, there's my blog. Now, as we go through here today, there are some articles that refer to these tools, and I will have noted them at the bottom of the slides, and that's the main blog, which is also fully searchable. There's more than 800 articles, and as you all know, it's free. So, autosomal DNA, the inheritance story, I'm assuming at this point that we all know that the autosomal DNA tests all of our chromosomes with the exception of the Y and that it matches us to our cousins based on common inheritance segments of DNA. If you are a beginner and you are just learning, uh, Emily Asselino, who is not in the room right now, but she is at the Family Tree DNA booth, has written a beginner's book on uh, genetic genealogy, and she has a few left um, to sell here at the conference if you just talk in privately. So we're not going to spend any time on introduct uh, introductory. We're going to look at the tools. Now, when I wrote this for uh, Morris, I said there were nine tools, and when I actually went through uh, and did this, uh, there were 12 tools. Uh, there are 11, and it is a surprise that we're going to uh, to talk about at the end. Uh, we're going to talk about matching, the X chromosome, uh, phase family matching, searching in common with, not in common with, uh, advanced matching, the chromosome browser, the matrix tool, my origins matching, spreadsheet matching, and triangulation. So before you can really use these tools effectively, you need to put gas in the car. You know, there's no point in buying a Lamborghini if you don't put gas and you can't, you can't drive it. So there's several things that you can do to help yourself and that I really want you to do before using or attempting to use autosomal tools at Family Tree DNA. First of all, up, either upload your JetCom file or create a special file for uh, use with the Family Finder tool. I created a direct line only um, pedigree chart. And I did this for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't really need all the information, nor do I want the information for who, you know, uh, someone I'm not related to uh, genetically is in there. It just kind of mucks up the works for me. 
Um, I also did the same thing at Ancestry.com, it's in here at .com, okay? Uh, because I just, I, all I wanted was my direct line, I know I did, I saw my uh, my direct line uh, ancestors, because that's who I'm hunting for. I don't really care about their brothers, wives, sons, wives, daughter. I, I only care about my direct line ancestors in terms of DNA, okay? So um, I actually created a uh, ancestor pedigree only back about 10 generations, and I put that in, and that's what I use. Um, so I, you can create, you can upload a gen comp file, you can create your tree manually. Uh, do be aware that if you link people to the tree and you have to upload it again, you're going to have to redo your links. Um, so yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but it's the way it is. Um, you are going to add lineage to your tree after you get it uploaded by connecting anyone who has tested that is fourth cousin of Corsa. So if, if, uh, if this lady sitting right here is my cousin, my cousin's actually in the room somewhere, I don't see, there she is, my cousin right over there, uh, she matches me, I found her out on the bench out front, I, we didn't know she was going to be there. Um, what, if she matches me, or actually matches my mother, what I want to do is I want to put her on the tree, so I want to develop the tree till I get to her, and then connect her DNA, because then it allows the software to do work for me that I don't have to do. So that's, that's a real benefit. So your, your tree will also need your ancestral surnames. If you upload a tree today, the software will then go in at Family Tree DNA and they will add the ancestral surname from your tree and that's all the surnames. So if you have your ancestors' wives, brothers, wives, make name in there, it's going to add that to your list. You don't want that. That's one reason why I don't do that. So here's your surveying list. This shows what happens when you actually have surnames in there. It, uh, it, it takes those surnames from your GenCom file, adds them to your list, and then when, when she and I have a match, it shows me by bolding our common surname, uh, it brings them to the top of the list of bold. So that's why it's important to have this information in there. If you have um, in my file, let's say I have Estes spelled E-S-T-E-S, but I want a variant in there, E-A-S-T-E-S, because that's how some people spell it, I can add that manually, and you do need to do that. Add your surname manually along with your variant spellings, because the GEDCOM file will not overwrite anything that you have manually in there. Okay? Well, on over then. The, the so, you want to connect the DNA of your known matches to their location on your tree, because that allows family phasing to display, uh, uh, enable family phasing and allows relationship display. Not estimated relationships, but actual relationships based on where that person falls on your tree. And that's uh, my mother, and that shows um, that from the perspective of my granddaughter, uh, the uh, family phasing and things that we can do. So that's what we're going to be talking about, is the various tools that utilize these things. So this is housekeeping. To put gas in the car, get ready to go, because until you do all these housekeeping things, you are not going to be able to benefit fully from the tools that they provide. So let's still look at options. All of the options <coughs> um, for uh, family tree DNA are available at, at the top here with this uh, first red arrow uh, under the drop down. So all of your options, why my Conrail Family Finder, whatever <coughs> testing you have done are available there, big one. But over here, under the Family Finder uh, section on your home page, the first thing we are going to look at now is my origins matching. How many of you know that there is matching in my origins? Not very many. My origins has matching in there. And people don't know that. So let's look at that. Under my origins, when you, um, that's your ethnicity portion, of course, and when you go in and you look at the map, and you look at, you know, this is my uh, ex expanded version, here's where all my people are from over here, but at the left-hand side, under shared origins over here, if you opt in, and you do have to opt in, it's an opt-in, and what it will show you is all the people that match you on the same ethnicity. So let's say I'm looking for, you know, my, um, don't laugh, because, you know, I'm always making fun of people in there. 
their Cherokee princess, but I really do have Native American ancestry that I share with that cousin right there. Uh, so let's say I'm looking for somebody that has a, you know, also has a Native American ancestry. Now that doesn't mean I match them on that line, but it is a place to begin to look, isn't it? So it, it shows you by your shared ancestry here in this column um, what the common ancestry is that you share with them. So you can, that's one tool. It, it, it's a hint. All of these are, are hints. So this is your autosomal match list. And the way I'm going to handle this, both today and my presentation and tomorrow, is each of these pages is from the perspective of the person whose account it is. And when you manage multiple kits, sometimes it's, it's easy to forget whose perspective you're looking at this from. So in this case, this is my granddaughter's um, autosomal DNA. So we are looking at this uh, over here, and there's all kinds of data. And I know the half of your eyes just glaze right over when you see this much data, because you're like, oh, no. Okay, now what? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the kinds of data that you need to look at that you may not even realize is on this page. So uh, that's my son. Now, we had a swab party at Christmas. This tells you how boring my family is. We had, we, I gave DNA kits to my my granddaughter, my, my grandkids are really interested in this, and I said, well, okay, now your parents have to swab, and your grand, other grandparents have to swab, and your aunts all have to swab, so you know how much money I spent on family Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> so my son's like, I can't believe she's making me do this, and my daughter-in-law is like, I can't believe she used this picture of me publicly. <laughs> so somebody take a picture, so I'm going to show her. Um, and so the things that you need to notice on this page is right here. This is phase matching. This shows you that the person, and in this case, that's my granddaughter. This is from her perspective, okay? This, this person is related to her on her mother's side and her father's side, and of course, that's her mother and her father. And um, this is her sister who's related to her on both sides, right? Through her mother and her father both, and her maternal grandmother, and that's me, the paternal grandmother. So, these are the kinds of things that, that that shows you. And up here at the top, you can see that it, the tab, after you get everybody linked and connected, shows you how many maternal and paternally phased matches you have. Some won't be phased either. Um, this is your estimated relationship based on uh, an internal algorithm of total thin organs and longest block. So they're estimating the range of relationships they think that this person could be. This relationship over here is a real relationship that's calculated based on how you have been connected in your tree. So that will tell you the real relationship. The X match is a special inheritance path that we're going to talk about here shortly. And then I look at this, and I want to point something out to you. See that? It says mother. Does that look like my granddaughter's mother to you? So I emailed Family Trinity and I said, my, sex, my son needs a sex change operation. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Richard, the CFO, emails me back and says, uh. <laughs> but here's what I did. If you want to know why you have to tell them when you buy a kit what the gender is, well, these kits actually got swapped. I swapped my son, my son's on my daughter-in-law's kit, and when I fixed it, I forgot to tell him to fix the gender. So if you look up here and you go, that can't be right, it could be because the gender is wrong on the kit. It could also be because you filled them in incorrectly in the tree and made them a, 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 a daughter or a son or, or, or an uncle or an aunt when you should have made them the other one. So, uh, so if you see something funny, it's probably because of that. Uh, this is... This section here is shared thin organ the longest block. And in general, the bigger those numbers, the closer the relationship. So there's lots of good stuff here. But look here. There's something called more. Do you know? And how many people have looked under this little more? There's actually three places for more. Three of them. So we're going to look at those next. The first place for more is that little plus uh, that I just pointed out. And that more brings up... Uh, it shows you the test taken in the haplogroup. So it shows you mitochondrial and why do they affect applicable. 
And clicking on those surnames over there, uh, on the right, those little ones, brings up the entire list of ancestral surnames. Now, given that, of course, this is my granddaughter, uh, the, the, a whole bunch of them are highlighted, which is not useful, but it's my granddaughter. I really don't need to know those surnames for her. Um, and then, the, if you click on the profile over there, you also get additional information that you don't get anyplace else on Family Finder, including the maternal and paternal oldest um, relatives, the oldest ancestor. So there's uh, quite a bit of information there that's available. If you have something here, like I would want to put my blog, I might want to put an ancestry tree, I might want to, who knows what I want to put there, uh, another website, uh, and you can put under the about me and you can put additional information. So always check there because you don't know what somebody's entered. Some people enter their gem match kit. In there. Let's talk about X matching, the X chromosome. You know, for a long time I, I said the X isn't the same. In fact, I have a couple, um, one called something like the Henri X, and I don't mean that's white, but, but the X is different, and people don't really understand that. In a nutshell, not only does the X chromosome have a special inheritance path that you can use very effectively to determine who is and is not uh, related, but it also, the serum organs and the matching is different. Um, when you see an X on a person with whom you match your family tree DNA, it means that they match on the X in addition to something else that passes the threshold. So, what that really means is if I match to somebody on a big segment and a tiny little sliver is an X, it's going to show the X also. So don't get all excited. Go into the chromosome browser and look and see how big that X chromosome actually is. It needs to be twice as big, rule of thumb, as any other for you to take it as seriously. So if your personal threshold that you're using is seven centimorgans or ten or five or whatever that is that, that's relevant in your mind, it needs to be double that on the X because the SNP density on the X is only half as much. So in the same space on the X chromosome, we only get half as many SNPs. So if, it, if your personal threshold is five, then you're looking at ten. If it's seven, you're looking at fourteen or fifteen. Okay? So if you... Um, the X is not mitochondrial DNA either. A lot of people confuse that because they know X has to do with female, but that's but then they think X and mitochondrial, but it's not the same. And I have an article. If you have people that are confused, uh, there's a blog article, X matching and mitochondrial DNA is not the same thing. Because um, I have a lot of people that are confused. And by the way, the, what, uh, the way I write blog articles is when people say, I don't understand this, and then I think, oh, well, I should write a blog article. So here's an X inheritance chart. Um, I use the um, Charting Companion by Progeny Software to create these, and it's a, it's a reporting software that you just simply put on top of your using it in conjunction with whatever software I use for matching. So, um, so what this does is it creates for you an inheritance chart for the X chromosome. So because of the male inherits the Y chromosome, it's not uh, inherit an X from his father, he only has his mother's X chromosome. So we know, in my case, if I have an X match on somebody that's based paternally, and it's a real X match, not one of the sliver matches that I mentioned, it has to come from his mother's side because he didn't get an X from his father. So any place that's white on this screen cannot have been inherited um, so I can't share an X chromosome with that person. So if I have a legitimate X match, match it has to be one of these colored blocks in here. It's a, this is an extremely useful tool. I print this out. I have a printout of this, and I keep it where I can look at the matches and then look at that at the same time so that I can see who actually is a real candidate. So let's look at searching. That's your next tool here. Um, the default search uh, provides you with both a uh, current surname and a, um, any surname that's here. So I put in Miller because the examples I'm going to use for the rest of this are on my mother's uh, uh, paternal side uh, in the Miller family. 
So what you do is you put the Miller in there and it searches for anybody who has the surname of Miller or who has the ancestral surname of Miller. And it brings up those matches. So it's up to you then to decide if they're relevant to do uh, further research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one of those people and I want to see who I had in common with. And this is, you know, I, I don't know if this is a bug or a benefit or a design flaw, but I'm going to tell you how it works and you can all decide for yourself how that happens, what it is. If you put Miller and then you select somebody and you click in common with, what are you going to get here? Because uh, I selected um, R. Miller. I'm going to just get the people in common with R. Miller that also have, that came up in the Miller search. If that's what I want, that's great. But if that's not what I want, what I have to do is just simply go up here and backspace out Miller in the search box, and then I get everybody that I match in common with R. Miller, regardless of whether they have Miller in their tree. Because if they don't have Miller in their tree or their last name's not Miller, it's not going to come up here. Now, in, in, if that's what you want, that's fine. Sometimes that's exactly what I want. But sometimes that's not what I want because, you know, not everybody loads a tree, and I still want to see those names. So why would you ever use, that's in common with, that's the people you match in common with that person that I just showed you, okay? You, it's obvious why you want to do that, but why would you ever want to use something called not in common with? Well, my mother is, um, my father was deceased in 1963, so obviously he's not DNA tested because while well, I'm old, I'm not that old, you know? Um, my mother tested before she passed away. It's the best legacy my mother ever left me telling you what. Uh, I thank her every day for doing that. So I want to see my X matches that are not in common with my mother, okay? So what I do is I select my mother, and then I go up here, that's her, and I go up here and I put not in common with. So what I get are all my X matches that are, are either, at that point, one of two things, from my father or their, um, by chance. So they're, they're, but they're not my mother. But that allows me to narrow that down by saying not in common with a particular person. In common with is not triangulation. We're going to talk about triangulation in a minute. But the in common with feature shows you who you do match in common, but it doesn't mean that you match them from the same line, and it doesn't mean you match them on the same segment. Tool. It's a tip, it's a hint, it's a place to go. But you can see right here that these two people match in common with, I think it was my mother I was using at this point, but if they, one is from um, the father's side and one is from the mother's side, but they do match the same person in common with my mother. So in common with is a tool, but don't take it to be more than it is. It's a great tool, but it's, it's not the, the answer at the end of the rainbow. So let's talk about triangulation for a minute. How many of you are confused by triangulation? I knew that. Okay. Let me tell you two things. First of all, at the end of this presentation, I have a, I have a great surprise for you. And second of all, I have an article coming out very, very shortly that is uh, titled, uh, I don't know what it's titled exactly. It's about exactly what triangulation is. And it's in light of the new, new tool that's coming. Um, we have an article that will be published today after this uh, session ends. Um, so don't go looking now. I want your attention up here. It's not out there yet. Uh, so triangulation is a technique. And what I use for this is an actual triangle because you match person A and B. Okay? So I match my cousin back there and I match this lady sitting right here. But if this, if this lady sitting right here doesn't match my cousin on the same segment that I match both of them on, then they're from different sides of the family or one of them is by chance. So triangulation is a tool that helps you determine whether your matches on the same segment are actually from the same side of your family and are legitimate matches that will help you genealogically. So person A must match person B and C on a reasonably sized segment. Do not go into small segments yeah, I'm not telling you they're not useful someday, 
but most of us have enough larger ones, especially when we're starting. We don't need to deal with that, so stay away from small segments for that. A 500 SNPs or larger, that's because we want enough SNP density to also, uh, I don't want to use the word guarantee, but to, uh, to make it hopefully a legitimate match. Uh, person A, B, and C cannot be So let's take a look and see on the chromosome browser 
uh, what we have. But before I do that, I want to show you this relationship. This is on the Miller line. And the Miller, uh, you know, you, we talk about wines, but there's always a, an unspoken spouse. Because when you find out you descend from a couple, you can say, I descend from the, from the Johann Michael Miller line, but it's really the Johann Michael Miller and Susanna Burkhall line. Okay? So here's how these people that are testing are all related. Now, I tested every one of these people, so I'm telling you up front, I have access to their kits, personally. But it helps me a great deal because I can use the tool and I can go in and verify that the tool is actually reporting correctly and things like that. So, these people are related. All these people at the bottom tested. And this one's really interesting because, look, this person, H.A. Miller, these people were first cousins. So, he's going to have more Miller DNA than he should have for where he is in the tree if his, if his parents or his ancestors weren't first cousins to each other. So here's the chromosome browser. And what we did is I selected these five people from the perspective of my mother, so the, the black background, I'm sure you all know, is the person from whom you're looking. But I want to draw your attention to chromosome 3 here because look, Several people match my mother on a common segment here on chromosome three. So let, uh, and that's these people that I selected from that line. So let's see what we can do with this. I downloaded um, additional information from that line, and we can see here, I, I, I color coded this, and we can see here that these different people, there's three areas where multiple people match my mother. So the question is, do these people triangulate at all these points? Now, these people are pretty close. They're, when you go back to the pedigree chart, wrong way. All right. Sorry about that. I'm not going back to the pedigree chart. When you, but if you look at the pedigree chart, they're not that distant. We're not talking about seven generations ago. We're talking within the last three or four generations. So I'm pretty, and that's how I was even able to find these cousins to test. So what we're doing here is we're going to look and see if they actually triangulate with each other. And you can't do this directly, so, but because I have access to each of their kits, I can go in and see if they match each other. So they will either be from my mother's side, from, from her father's side, or identical by chance. There are three alternatives. There's only three alternatives. So, if there is no three-way match, then you know it's not a common ancestral match, or A, B, and C. And there's a blog article that talks about that. Okay. I'm just going to hold it. Okay. So the next thing, the next tool to use is the matrix. And if you put these people into the matrix, you can determine if they're related to each other, if they match each other on family tree DNA. You cannot determine if it's on the same segment. Now, Jim Bartlett has done more uh, segment, actual segmenting probably than anybody else in mapping his own segments. And he said that it's very rare that he finds a match that, and they don't try and delay. Um, so, I mean, you can take that for what it's worth. It's a tool. But look here. This is really interesting because two of these people, W. Lentz and C. Lentz, they, they match all these other people, but they, their match should be here. Their match isn't there. This says they all match each other. Well, that doesn't make sense. Surely they match each other, right? They're really closely related. You think they match? I thought they match. Well, how could they not match? I mean, that's a big statement. So, I've downloaded the data. Because it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. <coughs> so here's what I did. Now, remember, I have access to all the kits because I'm, I'm so I color coded these. Uh, R. Miller is pink, and Cheryl is uh, yellow, and Barbara is my mother. So I downloaded all three of them into a common spreadsheet. I color-coded them so I could, I'm a visual person, I needed that. So I look here, and look, this one, they all match on the same segment and to each other, okay? So you've got Barbara to each person, and then you've got these people to each other. They triangulate. This one down here, they triangulate. This middle segment there, do they triangulate? No, they don't. Mother matches both of these, but these two, there's no match to each other. So the matrix was right. But what does that mean? Who knows? 
What does that mean? One is, she's got that right. One is from the mother's side, one is from the father's side. Now, one could have been by chance, except look how big these segments are. These segments are in the range 17 and 27. Those aren't by chance. Those just, that's just not something we've seen, uh, with segments that big being by chance. So these are very likely one from my mother's side and one from my father's side. But on these other segments, they do turn into them. Now, I did not expect that, so I didn't believe it. I went to great lengths to see if there was a bug, um, if there was something wrong. If I'm like, that can't be. So the next thing I really want to do is talk about, uh, you may not be fortunate enough to have access to the data like I do, OK? Now, if you're a project administrator, you have some level of access, but not everybody is. And if they're not in your project, you don't have access anyway. So I'm constantly wanting access to somebody's matching data that I don't have. So I need to triangulate it, and I need a tool to triangulate it. Now, a lot of people, some people, if they're interested, they'll reply, and they'll, they'll provide you with their, their information, but not everybody does. So Family Tree DNA is working on a triangulation tool. Uh, Bennett announced that at the Jewish genealogy meeting, so I can say it publicly if you did. Uh, they are working on a triangulation tool. Um, it's been in the works for almost two years. Um, but there are also a lot of other priorities, like, you know, that big Y reprocessing that's going on? Well, sometimes the triangulation tool gets uh, slides down underneath whatever the next, um, the next uh, process is. So uh, today, I have a surprise for you um, and an introduction to make. Um, Warren, would you raise your hand and like stand up? I want you to all turn around and look at this man with his hand up, stand up, stand up. Because you cannot all rush him and kiss him at once, okay? <laughs> you have to stand in line and take a ticket, okay? Because he has developed a triangulation tool that runs on the family tree DNA site, so you don't have to download, you don't have to do anything, and you don't have to take notes because the blog that is going to be published half an hour after the conference closes today has all the instructions in it you will need. So, hey, I want you to give him this man a round of applause. So, this tool is also free. So, I, I you know, this is, this is one of the things in the genetic genealogy community. So, here's what it, how it works. Um, and he will, before I forget to tell you, he will be in the Family Tree DNA booth off and on and around the conference tomorrow as well. And so I, I want you to go out and buy more kits for all these people that you now want to triangulate, especially if the people you've transferred and they're not full transfers because there's not enough uh, DNA, you know, if they're on that Ancestry V2 or the V4 or V5 23 move. So let's look at what this tool does and how it works. Uh, what you're going to do is, in the chromosome browser, uh, after you bring up your, your family uh, matches, just like if you're selecting in common with the chromosome browser, you're going to select the people to triangulate. Except after you install the tool, uh, and it's literally a one-click install if you already have Chrome on your system. I use Chrome. There, he does uh, provide other uh, compatibility with other browsers, but I only use Chrome. So, uh, but it installs a little tab here on the Family Tree DNA site because it's a browser plugin. So what you do is you select the people to triangulate up to the five, just like you do any other time, and then you go in and you click on this, and there's a little drop-down box um, that shows you, gives you triangulated segments. You click on triangulate, <coughs> and it shows you the triangulated segments. So I pick those same people, and this is what the triangulator tool looks like. It shows you the areas where they match in yellow, but the area where they triangulate is in red. And guess what? That same area is absent, isn't it? We have the first part of chromosome 3 right here, uh, the first segment and the second segment, but the middle segment is also absent here. So this worked exactly the same way as my uh, manual uh, uh, triangulation that I did by downloading the various different people's um, spreadsheets. So this is a great tool 
Um, he's been working on it for some time, and I've been uh, being a guinea pig, so uh, because I was really anxious to get it, it was a wonderful thrill. Uh, and back the night that I uh, that he he, I, we, he was helping me uh, download, we were doing the early documentation stuff. I spent I stayed up all night. I mean, literally all night. When the sun started to come up, I made myself go to bed. I think you were online that night. Yeah, that's the night. Yeah, yeah. I'm like Maurice, you're up all night, but so are you. Virginia, <laughs> Virginia. So, oh, so, what do you want to do to make the most of your autosomal DNA at Family Tree DNA? You want to test everybody. Test everybody you can. Test second cousins. Buy those kits. Take them to family reunions. Um, Christmas. That's a wonderful time. Test your grandkids too. Test your kids. Test them all. They won't necessarily help you in terms of going back further, but they will help you understand it's a good way to pass this love on uh, as long as you don't inundate them with it. But my granddaughter has really been the key to this. She was actually going to be here to present with me tomorrow. She's a teenager, but it did not get some travel issues, and she was not unable, she was unable to do that. But it's a way to bring the next generation into this cycle when they can see something snazzy and real on the browser and it makes them excited. Um, transfer your results for 23andMe, uh, B3, and the Ancestry B1. It's the same chip as family tree DNA, so you get all your matches. Uh, you don't have to worry about only getting closest matches. Retest for uh, 23andMe version 4, version 5, which is the new uh, chip since August the 9th. And the Ancestry B2, if possible. Now I say if possible, if some, you know, someone's died, or you can't get them to test again, then the best you can do is to transfer those in. Uh, but you'll only get your closest matches, and that's not because family tree DNA is being ungenerous, it's because the chip doesn't have like, that much overlap that they can give you all of them, so they're just upfront with you if you're only getting your, your uh, generally closest matches. Usually between 20 and 25% of the matches you would get if you tested on the same chip. Um, use all the available tools. Don't miss them. I have a, a little procedure that I go through where I just step through. It's like a flight pre-flight checklist. I just step through each one of these because you don't know what you're missing if you don't. So, you know, think about these and how to use them most effectively. Put gas in the car. Put a tree up. Link those people. You know, do all the things you can do to help yourself so that the system can help you find those space matches or those in common with or those surnames. If you find a link to somebody who doesn't have that, email them, offer to help them with their tree. Do whatever you need to do to help you and make this a more useful environment for everybody. Uh, upgrade people, of course, with their permission, but as an administrator, uh, I can't tell you who the kids I've paid for, I've paid part of, I've paid all of. I email people directly when the sales happen at Christmas time and in the summer, and I say, did you know this, and this is how it can help you, you know, and if I hear back nothing, fine, but if it's one I really want, I just tell them. I, there's a scholarship. They won't take you up on it a lot of time if you tell them you're paying for it because they're embarrassed, but if you tell them I have a scholarship for this line, that saves the, the, the embarrassment, and who cares what you're paying? You've got the information and you're sharing it. Well, and they're willing, you know? So, uh, and also don't forget about why mitochondrial DNA, because sometimes we get so excited about this that we forget that part, and it's a very valid part of our story. So I have a standing offer for anyone who descends from my Y and mitochondrial lines, any of my ancestors that I don't have Y and mitochondrial why DNA and mitochondrial for, I pay for the test. I, on my 52 Ancestors series, I say at the bottom of everyone, there's a scholarship for this. And yes, I have paid for one. And I don't care, it's cheaper than any trip to the courthouse you could ever make if you've got to go more than 39. You know, and it, it's a very, very valid part. And more than one time, that's actually just two of my native ancestors that I didn't know who they were, and that's how you found those native ancestors was through mitochondrial DNA testing of lineages of that. So, uh, so don't forget about that. If it's, it's a part of your lineage too, uh, have fun. This is about, you know, it's like we get so serious sometimes we forget to have fun. And so have fun and enjoy it and meet your cousins and 
and, and do all these things and bring it into the next generation. You know, we are on the cusp of leading edge technology. We're still on a frontier. We're all those pioneers that homesteaded, that we're homesteading the DNA that our ancestors gave us to take into the future so we can now work back to our home. I don't really close earlier, now I can't get close at all. Are we married? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is working, but it's, um, I think I need to turn on the volume. I'm not entirely sure how. So I'm going to turn this one off, and I think we'll just use your, your microphone instead. Okay. That might be a way of doing it. Thanks so much, Rosa. That was really, really good, and what a wonderful surprise at the end. So now we're going to all be triangulating. All night. All night long. <laughs> well, well, into the next morning by the looks of things now as well. Are you going to be uh, showing people like later tonight? We're going to get thrown out at 6, so tomorrow you'll be out somewhere near, and you'll uh, help people with the media and ask them some questions. At the Family Tree DNA booth. Okay. So you can go there by kids, see him triangulate. Now, well, I have a question about that actually because um, when you use the tool, it actually identifies very nicely a triangulated segment. What do you do with that? Do you still have to have the spreadsheet with all your matches in it, or how do you actually organize it once you've actually identified what is a triangulated segment? Gosh, that's such a good question. You'd think we set this up. He has so generously provided us with a little download at the very bottom of the computer. Well, uh, at the bottom here, okay, thank you. Of this, right here, you can download the uh, different segments that triangulate, and then you can pop those into your spreadsheet that you're keeping if you want to as triangulated segments. Or you can just download them if you want to. But that's what I did, is I put them in my spreadsheet. It's in the same format, exact same format. So, great question. Any other great questions? There is a question from Debbie here at the back, which I'm... Um, Debbie, if you come over this way, and we'll meet in the middle. There we go. <coughs> we talk about identifying known pilot regions. What about unknown pilot regions? How do we know when a triangulated segment is likely to be a pilot region? Hi. Good question, and um, I'm coming back here. This is a big problem, pilot regions. How do you recognize them? Okay. Um, you know, the English, the language that divides us, I'm like, pilot regions, airplane pilot, um, pilot, okay. uh, pilot, there are a number of published pilot regions, and that's what's in the blog. Um, there are, an, there's another type of pilot region, and Ancestry actually strips this out, that's one of the things that they do. They look at areas in your DNA that's too matchy. Well, let me tell you, some of those segments in my DNA that are too matchy are my Acadian ones. And those Acadian lines, there's an endogamy in those lines. So I do match a lot of people. And you could consider the pileup region, but it's a useful pileup region for me. Uh, in some cases, those, those people that I'm piling up with, I may, not, I may not necessarily recognize the lineage, but they're all from a certain part of the world. They're all from Germany. They're all my Acadian line or my brother line. So you can recognize the pileup region Sometimes when you look at you see a lot of people that are matching you on the same region that may not have a discernible link back to that family. They may or may not match each other. If they don't match each other, then they're not triangulated. So you can throw them out immediately. Uh, but it's a really good question. But the ones that are documented are on that, uh, in that article, and they're taken from academic papers, and they're areas when you start seeing matches. It doesn't mean they're entirely invalid, if you have a pile of, uh, match somebody on chromosome 6 in the area of the HLA region, which is documented in that article, and that's the only part that you match them on, then it's probably not a valid match because that's uh, part of the region that makes it human. So it, it's a really good question over there. Okay, we have a question here from Jared. Sorry. There we go. Yes, we have um, 
autosomal tools uh, which we went through there, but we also have Y and mtDNA and we have big Y and so it's important. Are there any tools to make all of these work together? I think these are setup questions. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, asked if there were any tools to make these work together. The only tool to make them work together is the advanced matching, and that doesn't include big Y, and that includes just Y and mitochondria. So you can find out if somebody matches you both on the Y DNA and autosomal, which is another clue, or on mitochondrial and autosomal, as long as it's full sequence, which can be another clue. But there aren't any, at this point, other tools to make them all work together. And I don't know of any in the works. So. Other questions for Roberta? Okay, um, I think I had a question, but I forgot about it. Um, are, are you ever using Genome Mate Pro, for example? Or are you still using Excel spreadsheets, preferably? That's a really good question, too. Um, I, I actually have tried twice to use Genome Mate Pro. Let me, let me identify what it is. It's a tool that allows you to upload your matches from not only family tree DNA, but ancestry, although they don't provide chromosome data, so they're it's pretty much useless on Ancestry, and also from 23andMe, anyone who provides chromosome data. And they help you, they can't triangulate per se because they don't have the other side of the matches, but they help you with matching groups and uh, ancestors and things like that. I've tried twice to utilize it. It's a very technical setup, and the, I think the installation book was 172 pages long. Uh, I didn't finish at either time. But here's my issue. I have been doing this so for a long time. I have in my spreadsheet that I didn't show you, but I could, I have all kinds of notes in columns to the right of these. Who triangulates, what's your common ancestor, who else they match, uh, what we said in an email. I don't have any way to import that information that I've accumulated over all these years into Genome Make Pro. So it might be a good tool for somebody who's starting out, but it is not a tool that I, because I would have to go in after that and at one by one type all those things back in somehow. I don't want to do that. Um, there's two questions here. Let's have one here from a comment on, from Deborah. Yes, on um, GNP. Uh, Ben Benvenier started a, a genetic genealogy tool uh, group on Facebook, and there is an excellent explanation of going step by step by step in setting up that software. I had not gone the way you did. I started from scratch on this, and I found it very helpful. So you used Genome Pro? Yes. And is it is it worth it? I think so, but I had never done the way you had done. It. The key is starting from scratch. Because once you've already started, then it's, it's very difficult. Um, I don't know if you're referring to Leah Larkin Perkins. So, yes, it's uh, gene, uh, genealogy tools, tips and techniques. Is that the name? Somebody. Uh, Leah Larkin Perkins did was it nine steps or ten lessons? Uh, several, and it's archived. Twelve, seventeen. They will raise you. Yeah, but she did an excellent job of that. She went through step by step, so she took those installation instructions and then made them step by step. But there's still many steps, and like I said, I I've tried twice and I'm like, no, it's not worth it for me. But if you were for starting, it might be. So I'm not. Work, so yeah. What'd you do? I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> there was I another use question. It every day. <laughs> I've used JEDMATCH Tier 1, and I've got an enormous amount of information, and I really don't know where to go from here. Um, what, what is your opinion of, of JEDMATCH Tier 1? Well, most of us use JEDMATCH. I mean, because not everybody is tested the same company. And um, the people that do use JEDMATCH tend to be more um, interested in, in this field. I use Tier 2 because the tools that I find the most useful are actually in the upgraded version, you know, the, the for pay area. Tier 1. Yeah, that's the Tier 1. That's a tier one. Tier one. Yeah, the pay, that's the most. So I use those, I do use those all the time. My preference um, 
is I like this chromosome browser the family tree DNA has better because I think it's more visual, it's easier for me to see. Uh, so I have some preferences that way. I like Gordon's triangulation tool much better simply because I think it's a very visual, it's very easy to see. And, and, he, and you don't have to ask someone to download someplace else and things like that because a lot of people aren't going to do that, whether they're an ancestor, no matter where they're at, they're just not going to do that. So I do use that tool. And, and you know, I use the only ones I don't use anymore is 23andMe because they have, after they you know, changed this 47 times, that they've actually made it to the point where I think it's almost unusable. So I don't use that anymore, but I use all the other tools. Any other questions? Right, well, that brings us to the end of day two of Genetic Genealogy Ireland. What a wonderful way to, to finish it off, especially with a wonderful surprise. So I'd like you to uh, put your hands together to thank Goran and Roberta Elsie. Thank you.